Hi, Dr. Tucker. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for the talk tonight. Um, we'll give it about two more minutes before we get started. Uh, we'll wait till six so that the people still signing on can join. Uh, but then we'll get started and talk about the whole journey of cataracts, what they are, uh, what they include, and, and what we can do about them. So we'll give it another minute or two here and then we'll get started. All right. Is everybody able to see the, the slides and the screen showing up there? No, I can't see anything. Okay, let me look here. Anyone else? Is, it, is no one able to see this right now? No. What should we be seeing? Uh, there should be a slide that says cataract surgery, advanced technologies. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's see here. Okay, I'm getting a couple uh, messages in the chat box so they can see it. If you're unable to see the slide, then you may have to change uh, on Zoom. There are different things that you can click. So instead of looking at the video of the person talking, you can look at the shared screen. Yeah, it looks like several people can see it, so. Okay. All right. And if you can't, if, if you can't see it, um, we will have the slides again posted on our website and, um, you know, we'll, we're happy to share it that way. So it is six o'clock. So we'll go ahead and get started. But again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. This is actually our first uh, virtual webinar that we're giving. We've given this talk several times in the surgery center where we talked about it in person with folks, but we wanted to reach people that um, might not feel comfortable coming to that setting or that, uh, you know, this time is more, more easy for. So again, my name is Dr. Tucker. I work uh, at the Reynolds Crossing location, which is kind of between Glenside, Broad, and 64, kind of where those all come together. Um, we've got eight locations across the, the area here. And so, um, you know, we've got good doctors at every single location. And so uh, if you are interested in meeting with one of us, uh, we've got lots of options for you. All right, so first I'll just quickly go over the outline. We're gonna start by talking about what is a cataract? What are the symptoms of a cataract? We'll talk about some statistics and the basics of cataract surgery. Uh, we'll talk about the different methods, preoperative testing and lens options, and then <clears throat> happy to answer any questions that come up. Now, when we did this in person, you know, patients or, or participants would ask questions throughout. So feel free to ask questions, whether uh, you send it in the chat box, um, or if you wanna uh, come on and say, I have a question when we're talking about a specific topic, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, just when you're not speaking, just make sure you mute, the, uh, mute your microphone afterwards. All right, so let's start with the basics. What is a cataract? A cataract is a clouding of the natural lens of the eye. Um, everyone's born with a pretty, pretty clear lens and as you age, um, proteins accumulate in that lens and cause it to become yellow. Uh, if you wait too long, even brown. Uh, you can get white cortical spokes, uh, but it's just a clouding of the natural lens of the eye. The lens focuses the light on the retina. So if you're going to use a camera analogy, you can think of the lens just like the lens of the camera and the retina as the film of the camera. Another question or another uh, topic that comes up frequently when we talk about cataracts and glasses and correcting all of those things is astigmatism. And there's a lot of confusion about what astigmatism is. And it's a focusing error in the eye that can result in blurred vision. And so a, a good way to think about it is thinking about a basketball and a football. So when we're talking about astigmatism, we're talking about the front surface of the eye called the cornea. And in, in a, a person with no astigmatism, it'll be shaped like a basketball. It's a perfect sphere and all the light focuses in one plane. 
Um, if you have astigmatism, uh, that means your eye may be shaped a little bit more like a football. And that way you have two planes where the light focuses. And if you don't correct that, you will still have uh, blurred vision. Intraocular lens, uh, it's very important for patients to know when we're talking about cataract surgery, we're actually taking the cloudy lens out and putting a clear lens in. So it's not just cleaning off the old lens or taking out the old lens. You have to put a new lens in at the time of cataract surgery. Otherwise, you won't have a good vision. All right, so let's talk about the symptoms of cataract. So what would you notice if you had a cataract? So one thing that we often pick up on is a myopic shift or a change in the glasses prescription. So if each year you're going, uh, you say you were, had stable glasses for a long time and you start going to the eye doctor and each year it's getting stronger and stronger, that may be a sign of a myopic shift, which is suggestive of, of cataract. Uh, glare is probably the most common symptom patients come in for. They say, I just don't feel safe driving at night or the, the, the headlights from an oncoming car will, will blind me. Um, others will have light sensitivity during the day. The sun will really bother them and, uh, faded colors. Now faded colors is an interesting one because a lot of patients don't actually notice that until after the surgery. Uh, a common thing I hear is that wow, I actually thought my walls were yellow, but they're actually white or, uh, you know, about how dirty their, their, their house is now that they can see, you know, see the, the colors. Um, so that is something that we commonly hear. Halos and starbursts, again, around lights, whether it be a street light or a car light. Uh, difficulty in dim light settings. Again, you're looking through a cloudy lens. So often patients will come in and say, I just need a lot of light to be able to read now because uh, it just becomes more difficult. And then just general blurred or decreased vision. Oftentimes we see your best corrected vision drop over time. And that's again, suggestive of cataract. So uh, before we move on, let's talk about what you can do for cataract. So when you have a mild cataract, uh, you can just observe it. And observation may be all you need to do for several years. Uh, you can also use glasses to correct the refractive air from the cataract, but eventually it gets to a point where it's causing these symptoms. And the only thing you can do to help once you reach a certain point is cataract surgery. And again, that's where you take the cloudy lens out and put a clear one in. Uh, cataract surgery is very safe. It's very common. It's what I specialize in. I do a lot of it. That being said, it's still surgery. There's still risks. Uh, risks include infection. That's probably the big, bad, scary one. Uh, that's the uh, least common. It's very rare. Um, then there are other things that can happen during the surgery. We don't need to get into the exact details, but basically uh, with cataracts and cataract surgery, I do like to use the analogy of a peanut M&M. We take out the peanut, we take out the chocolate, we leave the candy shell in place, and that candy shell is where you put the new lens. So that candy shell is only one hundredth of an inch thick. So it's very, very, very thin and fragile. And so there's a very small risk that during the course of surgery, that candy shell opens, some of the lens falls and requires a second surgery. Again, not very common at all. And when it does happen, we have ways of, of fixing it, but it does typically require second surgery. Some of these other ones I have listed here are things that can happen that you'd probably never even know about. Basically, if you take Flomax or Tamsulosin, it can result in something called intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, where the, the colored part of the eye is kind of floppy. Um, zonulopathy, if you've had trauma to the eye, you're at higher risk of the zonules or the fibers that hold the lens in place being a little weak. That's another thing that we sometimes have to deal with. But all the cataract surgeons are well-versed in these different issues, and, and we can deal with them as needed. All right, so impact of decreased vision. Uh, this, is a, this is actually one of the first books I read when I was first learning cataract surgery. It's called Essentials of Cataract Surgery. And it, it went through what patients are more at risk for as their vision decreases. Uh, so it's not specific to cataract. Anytime your vision is decreased from one problem or another, these are things that can, that can happen. So worse in 2025, so only one or two lines worse than normal, there's an increased risk of falls and fractures. Uh, 
Uh, worse in 2040, uh, you can have functional declines in global health status. So patients can have more trouble getting around or activities of daily living or physical performance. And worse in 2050, which again is just four lines off normal, there's a greater risk of death, impaired visual field or risk of motor vehicle accidents. So um, it's just, it, it shows the importance of maintaining good vision the, be the best you can. All right, let's talk about specifically cataract statistics. So uh, cataracts are very common. I, I tell my patients that typically, you know, if you live long enough, you develop cataracts. It's just a clouding of the natural lens of the eye. So over 20 and a half million Americans have cataracts that are over age 40. There are about 4 million cataract surgeries done every single year. 95% um, report improved vision after surgery. I'd argue it's probably even higher than that. 90% have significant cataracts by 65. Uh, talking about some of those other terms we spoke about earlier, 52% of patients that have cataracts also have astigmatism. And basically 100% of people over age 40 have presbyopia, which is the need for reading glasses or the, uh, uh, the stiffening of the lens. Many patients have cataract, astigmatism, and presbyopia. So these three topics are things that we'll talk about as we go throughout the talk. So what I would like to do is kind of walk you through the journey of cataract surgery. So uh, before I get into some of the details of the surgery, we'll talk for a moment about what to expect when you're being evaluated. So you call, you make an appointment, you come on in, we take a look at the eye, uh, we do a refraction to check your glasses prescription. Uh, we look at the lens to see whether it looks cloudy. We also do a full comprehensive exam to make sure there's nothing else affecting the vision like glaucoma, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. So it's very important that you get that full comprehensive examination. Uh, once we decide you have cataracts, uh, we determine if glasses is good enough to fix it or if we need to talk about surgery. If we talk about surgery, we'll go through a lot of the details that we're about to talk about now. And then we also have a personalized discussion to talk about what might be the right fit for you based on your lifestyle and your needs and whether you like to wear glasses and all those different things. So let's start by talking about the surgery itself. Um, surgery itself, once you actually get started, it only takes about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the case. Uh, so it's a pretty quick surgery. Uh, there are different methods of anesthesia that you can do for cataract surgery. Monitored anesthesia care, where we have an anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist uh, monitoring your vital signs and taking care of, of you during the case is the most common. There, within that category, there's topical, which is where uh, you get medicine through the IV to keep you relaxed, but you are awake. Uh, we keep you numb with drops and, and medicine on the eye during the surgery. Uh, that's the most common way I do it. I do probably 98% of my cases that way because that is a really quick recovery time. You actually can see out of the eye even when you're going home that day. Retrobulbar block is where you uh, put some numbing medicine behind the eye. Uh, when they do that, the anesthesiologist will give you some medicine to put you to sleep for you know about 30 seconds to a minute while they do the numbing injection. Um, and then uh, that paralyzes the eye so the eye doesn't move and so that you can't close the eye. Um, the benefit of that are in complex cases or where there's a concern on, on uh, keeping the eye still. Sometimes that can be used and can be helpful. Um, and there's also surgeon preference. Some doctors like to do it topical. Some like to do the blocks. Uh, most people, most doctors offer both ways. And so um, it depends on the, the individual case. General anesthesia, where you actually go to sleep, uh, is very uncommon for cataract surgery. The only time we really do that are for severe tremors, um, patients that aren't able to, to lie still uh, or that have uh, uh, intellectual disabilities that prevent them from being able to cooperate for the surgery. Right. Medications. Um, after the surgery, there is a need for some medications and we'll talk about those. Um, in my clinic and every doctor again has their, their ways of doing things. So um, one doctor might do it a little different from the other but I'll kind of present on how I do things. Uh, there are different medications, steroid, antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory medication that I like to use. Um, some doctors use three separate bottles. Um, that way you have one for each one. Uh, some people use compounded drops and some use injectables or a combination of all three of these. 
Um, so sometimes we put antibiotics in at the time of the case. Sometimes we inject steroids if we need to. Um, and I'll walk through a couple of those options just to give you some background. So this is an, uh, a compounded drop. So what that means is all three of those drops I talked about, the antibiotic, the steroid, and the anti-inflammatory are all in one bottle. And so this is what I use after surgery. That way, instead of dealing with three bottles, you just have to deal with one. Uh, the only negative on this one is it does come in the mail rather than in the pharmacy uh, because pharmacies don't carry compounded drops like this. Uh, there are different implants you can do at the time of surgery, and some of this depends on insurance coverage and, and your, your anatomy and different things like that. But this is Dextenza. It's one of the, the steroid implants I use. It, it basically gives off a steroid for a full month, and that way you can stop the drops after a week instead of having to continue them for the month. Um, and I have a picture here that kind of shows how that works. We just insert that steroid in the, uh, the puncta which is where the tears drain towards the nose. It stays there for about a month and it, it absorbs and it completely dissolves and goes away after that time. So it's a nice option uh, for, for patients that, that wanna do that as well. All right, now let's get into actual cataract surgery. We already talked about the analogy of, of the peanut M&M and I'll use that analogy throughout. This uh, information is, is pulled directly from Alcon's website. That's the laser that we use. So when I talk with patients, this is what I, what I tell you. So there's two, two methods of doing the cataract surgery. There's standard manual incision cataract surgery. Uh, that's where everything's done by hand. That's what's covered by insurance. There's also laser assisted cataract surgery where the laser does all of the, what I'll call cuts, okay? So it makes a, a circle on top of the candy shell. It subdivides the lens into four quadrants. It makes the incisions and it corrects low levels of astigmatism. Um, and so uh, we offer both of those at the Virginia Eye Institute. Um, it's a personal, uh, the way I just describe it to patients is it's a personal preference on which technology to use. Uh, both ways, we're going to get the, the cloudy lens out. Uh, it's just, you know, using it for certain steps of the surgery. So what this uh, slide shows is the actual laser that's used for the laser assisted cataract surgery. Um, so what you can see on these different screens is you can see that the eye is docked and you can actually see the eye and, and plan where you're going to put the incisions. You can see the thickness of the lens um, and, and plan it from there. Uh, the, the, the laser itself only activates for about 20 seconds um, and then you release from the laser and then we take you into the operating room to do the second part, to actually take the lens out and put the new one in. Um, and this again is showing the screens of the laser that we work on when we're using the laser for the cataract surgery. And so sometimes you'll hear me talk about the circle on top of the lens. I consider that the most important part of the surgery because it determines the effect of lens position or basically where the lens is gonna sit after the surgery. And so you can see in the center here that the laser makes this perfect circle on top and it divides the lens into four quadrants. You can also see in this bottom corner that the laser makes the incision and this is the angle at which it makes it. So it's pretty, I, I think it's pretty fascinating. I think it's really neat that the laser can do some of these things for us. But again, it's just an option you have uh, as, as one of the options for the surgery. If, there aren't, if anyone has questions on what I've talked about so far, uh, feel free to, to jump in and say, say, ask a question. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, we'll move on from the actual surgery itself to talking about the different lens options and, and how to correct your vision. So again, the primary goal of cataract surgery is to take the cloudy lens out, is to get rid of the haze and the glare and all those symptoms you have with your cataract. Um, so that's the primary goal. The secondary goal is that we can reduce the glasses prescription as much as we can. And you have a bunch of different options for how we do that. So uh, first and foremost, um, there's a monofocal lens. Uh, that is what's covered by insurance. It corrects nearsighted and farsightedness. Okay, so it corrects for one distance. What that means is it can correct you for distance or near, but not both. So, uh, and, and we'll talk about that. So I would say of my patients, at least 98% choose distance correction um, with the intent of using reading glasses for up close. Uh, I do have you know, a couple percent of patients that are really nearsighted that like having that nearsighted being able to see up close and they'll choose to be corrected for up close 
with the understanding that they'll need to wear glasses to drive and to walk around and all those things. And so again, personal preference on that. And that's something that we talk about and individualize for each, each patient. Um, the monofocal lens does not correct astigmatism and does not correct presbyopia. And so what that means is it doesn't help with, it doesn't help with, again, if we correct you for distance, it doesn't help you with reading and it doesn't help with astigmatism correction. So what I tell patients is, if you're perfectly fine wearing glasses, this is the lens to go with. It's covered by insurance, there's no extra cost, and you'll still wear glasses afterwards, and that's perfectly fine, okay? Uh, there's no difference in the quality of the vision. Um, it, it's, it's just as good as the others. It, it's just, you, you may need glasses afterwards, okay? Um, the one thing you can do with a monofocal lens that, that some patients will do is what's called mini monovision, where you do one eye for distance and one eye for either computer or near work. Now, I only offer that to patients who have either done it before with contact lenses or naturally are that way, or who will try contact lenses and try it out because it's not for anybody. I personally don't think I would do well with monovision with just one eye for distance, one eye for near because that can affect your depth perception and different things like that. But if someone's done it before, or wants to try it, we can try it ahead of time, okay? Monofocal toric lens. So you'll hear the word toric a few times in the next slides. The toric lens is what corrects astigmatism. And so if you have astigmatism, uh, a toric lens can be used to, to correct the astigmatism. So it corrects both near and far sightedness as well as astigmatism. So um, it still does not correct presbyopia. So it doesn't help with reading if you aim for distance, but it'll fully correct your, you for distance. Um, so again, that's a toric lens. Now we're gonna move into some of the more recent or advanced technologies that have been developed in the last, that have been used for the last few years. Um, these have become very popular uh, for patients that are trying to decrease their dependence on glasses. Um, again, if, if you're fine wearing glasses, standard lens is fine, but if your goal is to reduce how often you have to wear the glasses, this offers a nice option. So this is called the Vividi, and the Vividi also comes as a Vividi Toric. So what that means is you can also correct the astigmatism with it. This is what's called an extended depth of focus lens, okay? So the goal of this is to provide good distance and intermediate vision and what they call functional near vision. So again, if you kind of hold the phone out, you know, you're able to pick it up. Um, but if you're going to sit and read a book, um, you're probably still going to use some reading glasses. So the goal is for most of your daily activities to not need to wear glasses with this lens. But again, for reading, you still will need them. Okay. The benefit of the Vividi is that it gives you an expanded range of vision with minimal side effects. The next few slides are actually from the manufacturer, Alcon. Um, it basically says it provides good distance quality and intermediate vision with, with the same side effect profile as any other lens. So there's no increased side effects that have been really demonstrated with this lens. Um, this again shows distance, intermediate, and again, functional near vision. Again, when I say functional near vision, the reason I, I, I emphasize the functional near vision is that it's not just designed to give you, you know, reading vision. It's more for kind of your everyday vision. Uh, this is a side effect profile, basically showing that it's the same as a standard lens, which is what, what's considered the gold standard. All right, I see your question. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, so this is the different, this is the technology and how the lens works. It basically stretches the light. So, uh, you'll see in a, the, a slide or two that the standard lens or monofocal lens will give you uh, a focal point for say distance. And then the light kind of doesn't stretch further and that's why you need glasses to see up close. What this does is it stretches out the light so that you have a wider range of vision. All right, this is that slide I was telling you about where um, it, it, it shows where the light stretches. So. First with the monofocal lens, which is the, the, the top line here, you can see at infinity, that's the infinity sign, at distance, you've got a nice focused point for, for vision. But when you look at intermediate, which is this point, the 26 inches, and near, there's really not much light there, and that little or no light there, and that's why you need glasses to, to focus the light at that point. 
The two that we're going to focus on tonight, the one I'm talking about right now is the Vividi lens. This is the bottom line. And you can see that it kind of stretches the light to cover this distance, intermediate, and getting close to near vision. Okay. And finally, the last one we're going to talk about next is the panoptics, which is a trifocal lens. You see it gives you good distance, gets you intermediate, and then also gets you the near vision. So it actually has three focal points. All right. So now we're going to talk about the panoptics. The panoptics is what's called a trifocal lens. So everyone's pretty familiar with bi and trifocals from glasses. And so what it does is it has different focal points. It gives you distance, intermediate, and near vision. So this lens gives you the best option of getting completely rid of glasses or to, to need glasses as little as possible. So if your goal is really to be out of glasses, this is one to consider but it comes with a caveat. So because it's giving you all three focal points, it has rings on the lens itself. And those rings do give you the risk of starbursts or halos at night. I say about a third of patients will notice the starbursts, about 5% of people will be bothered by them. So for someone that does a lot of night driving, let's say a truck driver, and might not be the best option because if you're one of those 5% that are bothered by the issues at nighttime, it might not be the best option. OK, um, and so we'll, we'll walk through the slides on this, too. Again, this gives you kind of distance and reading, including the, the, the phone, the driving, the, 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 the crafts. It gives you kind of a, a little bit of everything. It, it, this is really the first one of the first lenses that gets you kind of all three focal points. And that's the reason it's become pretty popular uh, in the clinical trials they did. It was it was very uh, people were very happy with it. Um, so again, very good patient satisfaction. And now, again, this is showing the side effect profile. And you can see uh, most bothered. So they are bothered by these symptoms, about 5% of people with those starbursts. So uh, more people are bothered by starbursts with this lens than would be, say, with one of the other lenses. So it is very important for patients to understand the, tr the potential trade-off when, when you go after a lens like this. All right, and again, this is just from Alcon showing, showing the same information. All right, now, before we move on to the questions, I'll kind of tell you a couple of the things I talk about with my patients. So um, these are options, and not everyone's a candidate for all these options, and not everyone should consider these options, okay? Um, I also do LASIK surgery, and whether you've had, if you've had LASIK, uh, that can impact which lens we talk about. So um, I don't typically recommend the panoptics in someone with LASIK. Now, there are some doctors that use it in, in patients with LASIK and have had good success, um, but you, you're at a higher risk of some of those aberrations that we talked about. And so it's very important to take all of this information, take it with a grain of salt until you have your personalized consultation so that you can see what may be the right fit. You might not have astigmatism, in which case, you know, you don't need to think about that. You might say, I'm fine with glasses, and then the standard lens is fine. You might say, well, my goal is to be out of glasses as much as possible. Then we talk about the panoptics. So, you know, we talk about these different things based on your eye and your, your history and what your goals are. All right. So let's, let's jump to questions and, and see if anyone has questions. Um, you know, I, I'm happy to talk about any individual circumstances. I know there's already one question. It said, after, after this is done, does your vision stay the same for the rest of your life? And that's a great question. Um, so the answer is yes and no. And so a lot of the changes that you have um, when you're in your 50s and in your 60s and your 70s and your 80s and your glasses prescriptions changing a lot, a lot of those prescription changes are due to the lens. As the lens thickens, it changes your glasses prescription, okay? And so taking that lens out will correct that, that uh, refractive error and you won't have change. The, the lens itself will never change again, okay? Because the lens is stable, it's, it's acrylic, it's a type of plastic, and so uh, it doesn't change. That being said, there are two parts of the eye that can affect the prescription. The lens, which we just talked about, and then the cornea. The cornea is the front windshield of the eye. And that usually changes less than the lens, but it is still possible that it changes some over time. I'd say 
for the most part, people are pretty stable after surgery, but they certainly can change some. They're usually smaller changes from, from, the, uh, from the cornea. Um, and I'm just going to follow, just follow these, this chat. I have it pulled up so I, I can keep answering these as we go. So someone else asked, how long do the lenses last and do they get cloudy? That's another great question. So the lenses themselves last forever. They never go away. Uh, it's rare to take a lens out. It, it, um, so, so they basically last forever. It's, a, it's acrylic plastic. Um, do they get cloudy again? Uh, it was another question there. So the lens itself doesn't, doesn't become a cataract again. That doesn't happen. But if you remember my analogy of the peanut M&M, we take out the peanut, we take out the chocolate, we leave the candy shell in place, and that's where the new lens goes. Um, the candy shell where the lens is sitting, which is behind the lens, can develop some cells that grow across it and become a little hazy. It's called a posterior capsular opacification. If that happens, there's a laser we can do called a YAG capsulotomy. It's not surgery like cataract surgery. It's a laser that takes a few minutes to do. Um, there's no incisions or anything like that. Uh, and we can open up that candy shell so you're not looking through that hazy capsule anymore. So if you ever hear someone say, my cataract came back, that's what they're talking about is that that candy shell needed opened up. Okay. Uh, so, so I hope that answered that. Um, and does Medicare pay for all the different types of lenses? Unfortunately, they do not. So uh, the standard lens, which what's listed, I think is basic, but it's, it's a standard lens. Uh, that is what is covered by insurance. The other lenses are not. And the way I look at it and the way I tell my patients is um, insurance is paying to get the cloudy lens out and a clear lens in, okay? That is the primary goal of cataract surgery. The secondary goal of reducing the glasses prescription, insurance doesn't care, right? So they, they don't care if you wear glasses afterwards, as long as they get the cloudy lens out. So you're not having the glare and starburst and things like that. But in terms of, of, of having a glasses prescription, they're okay with because they consider that more refractive or cosmetic in nature. So, um, so the standard lens is what's covered. The other ones are, are not. Uh, next question. Does this surgery help with floaters? Um, no, it does not. So uh, the lens, I don't have a diagram in front of me, but basically the lens is in the front part of the eye. The jelly is in the back of the eye. That jelly is where the floaters sit. And so, um, no, it does not help with floaters uh, because we do not go that far back. Okay. Why don't pharmacies carry compound drops? Uh, that's a great question. And some, there are pharmacies that do. There are what are called compounding pharmacies. And those compounding pharmacies do carry those drops. But your everyday, everyday uh, uh, pharmacy, like a CVS or Walgreens or Walmart, uh, they do not. And it's because of how they're made. Most of these drops that are used for most of the eye drops that you use um, come packaged directly from the manufacturer. And to make the compounding drops that hold the three different in one bottle have to be made. And so you, you use these different drops and put them in one bottle. And so special pharmacies can do that. There are compounding pharmacies here, but for ease of use, we do use one that, that mails it to you. All right, next question. I've had LASIK and I've had LASIK and doctors have mentioned that not knowing what my vision was before causes more concern about cataract surgery. Can you explain that? Sure, I'm happy to help. So uh, LASIK changes the shape of the cornea, which is the front part of the eye. And mm -hmm. it takes it from being a completely uh, average cornea to, to reshaping it so that you don't have to wear glasses after LASIK. Um, that can change the measurements um, for cataract surgery. And so, um, we use all we use a lot of advanced technologies and, and, and special technologies to uh, measure the cornea surface, but the predictability is decreased after you've had LASIK, so it's a little less predictable. Now we've come a long way. So if you go back 10, 15 years ago, uh, it was very unpredictable and hard to hit your mark after cataract surgery with someone that had LASIK, but the the, the it has gotten a lot better, and I'll say you notice a lot less of a difference, but you have to be prepared that there is a small chance that it's less accurate than in your neighbor who didn't have LASIK. All right. Uh, what is the reco recovery time? Um, 
recovery time is pretty quick. And so, um, again, some of that depends on the anesthesia that you have. If you elect to do the topical anesthesia where you do look straight ahead during the surgery, you actually can start using your vision that night. If you had a block, a retrobulbar block, which is where they paralyze the eye, then they take the patch off the next morning and you can start using your vision the next morning. I tell my patients no heavy lifting, bending, or straining for a week, but you're able to walk around and do your everyday activities even that day. Okay, um, perfect. I developed, uh, and I'm, what are the restrictions post-surgery? I'm going to jump to that just because that goes along. So every surgeon's a little different. You know, we use different incisions. We use different drops. We talk about things a little different. For me, after a week, you're pretty much clear. You can pretty much do what you want. Some are a little bit more strict and uh, in up to a month have a few restrictions. But, but for me, your wound is, is, is pretty well healed in a week. And so I feel comfortable having you kind of go back to normal activities at that point. All right, the next question. Um, I'm okay on time. Yeah, I'm fine on time. Um, I developed strong headaches in a sick stomach with progressive lenses. I stopped wearing the progressive lenses. Will multifocal lens create the same effects? Another great question that comes up very frequently. So uh, first, I, I would say progressives are not for everybody. You know, I, some people uh, do better with two separate pairs, one for distance, one for reading. Some people do better with a traditional bifocal, which has is, is what's called a lined bifocal. Um, but with regards to cataract surgery, um, they're not the same. They're completely different lenses. And so um, I have not found any correlation between how people do with progressives to how they do with these other lenses. Um, because again, with the, the lenses, it, it just kind of works. Now, that being said, there is a neuroadaptation period for any of these lenses, the, the, the multifocal lenses, for instance, that you have to give it some time to get used to. Now, would I say if, if you've had trouble adapting to things like progressives in the, in the past, would you be a slightly higher risk of maybe the starburst? Potentially. I haven't seen that in any study, any research study, but you'd have to wonder if, if, it, if, if you may have more trouble neuroadapting than someone that, that tolerates it well. Um, so it is something to think about. There's no definitive answer on that, but, that, but that's a good question. All right. How do you decide which eye to perform surgery on first? Another great question. Um, typically, I typically do the worst eye first. Uh, so if someone has a really bad cataract, I typically do that first so that you can maintain your good eye until we get the other eye done. That being said, there are situations where I don't do that, okay? So let's say we're considering monovision where one eye is primarily for distance, one eye is not. I always do the distance eye first or the dominant eye first because I wanna make sure we hit our distance target before we move on to the near target. Um, but it's something we discuss. Typically, most patients agree that they prefer to do the worst eye first, okay? I have dry eyes. How does that affect results? Another great question. So uh, dry eye can impact the measurements that determine which power lens can go in the eye. So for no matter what lens you choose, um, dry eye can impact the measurements. So for me, I don't do lens measurements on the day I sign up someone for cataract surgery. Everybody has to come back for a second visit to get measurements. Um, I have everybody use warm compresses, eyelid scrubs, and artificial tears before we do those measurements to optimize the ocular surface, whether you think you have dry eye or not, because a lot of people have it without knowing it. So that helps optimize the surface uh, to make sure that, that it's as healthy as possible. Now, for someone that's, that's uh, identified to have dry eye, sometimes you have to do even more. Um, sometimes we use anti-inflammatory dry eye medications like Restasis or Zydra, or we use um, punctal plugs, or we just, we have to be a little more aggressive with treating the surface because it does optimize the results. In terms of afterwards, the same thing, you want to maintain, you know, good, healthy corneas to, to get the best results from any lens you choose. All right. If you wear trifocal glasses, let's see, if you wear trifocal, so if you have trifocal glasses and astigmatism, um, so glasses, most glasses prescriptions correct some amount of astigmatism. And if you have a very little bit, let's just say you have a quarter diopter of astigmatism in your glasses prescription, that probably doesn't need treating. OK, you have to reach a threshold where using a torque makes sense. And that's, again, where, where we kind of individualize it based on all the, the testing that we do. All right. 
how much do the other lenses cost? Um, there's a, a spreadsheet on that where they, they go through the details. Um, and, and so I, I don't have all that off the top of my head because it, it depends on what you choose, whether you choose the laser, whether you choose the standard, whether you choose a, a toric lens, a Vividia panoptic. So um, that's something that or if you want to give a call, our surgical coordinator can go through the details with that with you, even before you come. They're happy to do that. Um, but I don't have all that data in front of me. I, I, I don't really get involved in that part. All right, how long do you use the drops if you don't get the implant that slowly gives the medicine? So um, if you're using three different bottles, uh, two of the bottles go for a month and they go four times a day for the first week, three times a day for the second week, twice a day in the third week, once a week in the fourth week, and then you stop. So you slowly come off of that, the steroid drop. The antibiotic drop, you only use for a week and then you can stop. Uh, if you do the combination drop, uh, again, it's one bottle. We do four, three, two, one taper. Uh, the same like we talked about a moment ago. If you do the Dexenza, I still have you do the drops for a week just to provide antibiotic coverage. And then you can just stop completely at a week. Uh, but again, so, uh, I just want to clarify with some of these questions that you're asking. Um, I'm really giving my experience and how I do things. So just know that not every doctor does it exactly the same. Um, they all offer different ways of doing it, different drops, different things. And so, um, you know, everyone has their experience and uses things slightly different. How do, how can you reduce the fear of surgery? So, you know, eyes are, are a touchy subject, right? I mean, we're all very protective of our eyes. I understand that. That's why I went into ophthalmology was to, to, to help people with their vision because I know how important it is. Um, I think that's one of the benefits of coming to the Virginia Eye Institute is we are super experienced in what we do. Um, this is what we do all day, every day. Um, so I, I think, you know, education, I think coming to things like this and understanding a little bit more about the surgery, about, you know, that it is low risk and that, um, you know, that we're, we're very good at what we do uh, should help. Now, um, in terms of actual day of surgery, um, there are different things that can be done. So you can take an anti-anxiety medicine if you need to before you come, if, you, if you're on anxiety medicine. Um, we do offer Valium in certain cases if a patient seems anxious and need, needs assistance. And then ultimately, you're going to have an anesthesiologist and a nurse anesthetist that can give you medicine to help keep you relaxed. But I do emphasize for my patients um, it is important to know that you're going to be awake. I never want someone to be surprised or caught off guard. So you are awake during the surgery, but you get medicine through the IV that keeps you relaxed and, uh, they can give you more if you're really anxious, but, but, um, uh, most patients afterwards, the most common thing people say is, Oh, we're done already. Okay. You know, so it, it's very common, um, for people to be more anxious than, than, than what, what they need to be. But again, I understand it's your eyes and we take it very seriously. Uh, can you drive home after surgery and recovery? So uh, in terms of surgery, no. So from the surgery center, you do need a driver and that's because you receive some anesthesia. So it, it's actually less to do with the eye and more about the anesthesia. You're not legal to drive after you received any type of anesthesia. Uh, so, so that's, a, that's a, a definite no-go. You do need a driver the day of surgery. Now recovery, that's a very touchy one and that's going to be doctor dependent and it's going to be dependent, patient dependent as well. So someone that comes in that has uh, 20, 30 vision, so pretty good vision, but gets a lot of glare at night, okay? Their non-operative eye is, perf is perfectly fine to drive with. And so they are okay, in my opinion, to drive the next day, the following day, et cetera. Um, but if somebody's other eye is, is really bad and say we aim or you had a lot of stigmatism, you're not quite, th quite there, maybe it's not safe to drive. And so a lot of that depends on your individual circumstance. And I always, we all, I like talk about that with every patient about whether you meet the legal criteria to drive both before and afterwards and all those different things. Um, but, uh, yeah, so very individual, uh, decision on that. Anything you can do, is there anything you can do before surgery to minimize pain? So pain is very, uh, very minimal and very well controlled. So um, it's rare for me to have someone have an issue with pain. Um, so nothing you need to do ahead of time. I and mean, we, we take care of all that. Like I said, we have anesthesia involved. We use a lot of numbing drops. Um, and, and so no, nothing you need to do.
All right. How common is it to get bleeding in the eye? And is a patch required after the surgery? Um, so bleeding in the eye from the cataract surgery itself is exceptionally rare, like very rare. That being said, you know, you have to understand that every doctor is different and, and every patient's different. So there are combined procedures you can do where you do a glaucoma surgery at the same time as cataract surgery, or you do a cornea surgery at the same time as surgery. And if you do one of those procedures, bleeding is not that uncommon. It's actually fairly common. And so again, individual circumstance dictates that the response to that, but for standard cataract surgery with no other procedures, it's very rare. Okay. A patch required after the surgery. That's another question. So um, again, that depends on the anesthesia that you do. Um, again, if you do topical anesthesia, the way I do it, uh, you you'll have a shield on the eye when you go home, but it has holes in it. So you can see through it. Uh, you take it off to put your drops on. Um, if you have the block where you put numbing medicine behind the eye, then you do wear a complete patch on the eye until the next day when the doctor sees you. And then they take the patch off and then you just wear the shield at bedtime to protect yourself from rubbing it while you sleep. How long do you take the steroids? I'm concerned about impact on blood glucose. Um, there's very, very minimal impacts of the steroid on blood glucose. This is a topical drop, so not a, an oral steroid. Oral steroids, like you're mentioning, um, can shoot the uh, glucose very high, but that's not what we use. We use a topical drop, and so I, I, I really never heard of anyone say they had a spike from, from the topical steroids, um, but at most a month is how long you can use the steroids. Do normal activities include driving? I think I kind of hit on that, but as long as your vision is good enough, you can drive even the next day. If you work on a computer all day, is it okay to go back to work after a day? Are there lenses that help with blue blocking? So that, that's, those are great questions again. Um, so uh, yes, I have many patients that go back to work the next day. You do have to see us the next day. We have a post-operative day one appointment. Um, but after that, you're fine to, to go back to work. I've also seen people at the very end of the day and they went to work before they saw me. That's also okay. Um, as long as you're, you're, you're seeing well and, and, and functioning, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, blue blocking. Um, all of our lenses that we use are what Alcon calls natural lenses. So they actually have a blue blocking filter in them already. And this was before it was even kind of researched. It's just, it's part of the lens. So it's nothing special. Um, and, uh, but yes, yes. Uh, how long do you wait to do surgery in the second eye? Again, this is a, a, a surgeon dependent question. Um, I'd say on average, uh, um, most doctors do about two weeks. You do one eye at a time, typically about two weeks apart. Um, there are certain cases, and again, patient specific. So there's certain cases where we'll go four or six weeks apart. So let's just say someone has a cornea problem called Fuchs dystrophy. Sometimes I'll spread those, those eyes out a little further so that you have more time to heal from the first surgery. Uh, sometimes patients have a really big glasses prescription, like minus 10 or minus 15. In those patients, if they do really well with their first surgery, sometimes we'll even do them a week apart. And, and what that does is, um, you know, you're not tolerating that difference between the two eyes and we get it done quicker. But again, it really depends on the surgeon and it really depends on the patient and, and, and whatnot. All right. What other questions? Okay. If you choose standard manual, is the only choice of lens monofocal lens. So no, again, this is very, very um, doctor specific in, in, on, on this question. So um, some doctors do the, the standard manual incision surgery, some do the laser, some do both. Um, and in terms of what the lens offerings are, it's the same thing. Uh, some doctors will only do all the lenses without the, the laser. Others will only do the advanced lenses with the laser and uh, some offer both. And so uh, my philosophy is I kind of let the patient decide what they want in terms of the technologies. And I offer all the technologies and um, will do it whichever way they like and whichever lens they want. That being said, the, the one that I'm always hesitant to do, and I don't know if I've actually done without the lasers, the panoptics, the panoptics being a trifocal lens requires, you know, really, really good centration. And so I do find benefit in the laser for that specific lens. Um, so I usually talk about that with the patient, but 
I, I put, I, I use, I do standard, I do laser, I do the monofocal lens, I do all the other lenses. Um, I do them with laser without. So uh, again, it's, it's personal preference in which technology uh, works for you and for, and for what you want. All right, after you do the first eye, you put a clear lens in the glasses, it still has uh, the prescription. That's a great question. Um, and so um, there's two ways of doing it. So for most patients, what I have you do is you just stop at our optical shop and they pop the lens out and just leave it blank. Um, you'd be surprised how uh, um, treated it is and how uncommon it is to actually notice it. Uh, oftentimes they'll come in for week one and I won't even notice. Um, but at our Huguenot office, which is right next to the surgery center, I think it's five or $10, I don't know, but they can put a clear lens in um, until uh, you get your new one. Now, um, and then after the surgery, usually three or four weeks after the second eye is done, or if you're only doing one eye, uh, we check you for glasses and you can get a new prescription then. But you absolutely can get a clear lens put in uh, at that office. And you can even take the glasses with you at the time of surgery and stop over that office after and they can do it for you then if you want the clear lens but again most people i'd say most people don't they just uh they just have it popped out at our optical shop and leave it like that another question asked about discouraging getting both eyes done at the same time so uh at the virginia Eye institute we do not offer <clears throat> what's called same day bilateral sequential cataract surgery. There are some practices, mostly out in California, I think Kaiser does it some, where they do both eyes at the same time. Um, it's kind of a controversial topic uh, in ophthalmology. There's some benefit in, in the sense that you um, get it over with, but um, there's that theoretical risk of infection um, or, you know, missing your target or not being happy with something or taking longer to heal. Um, so there are these different reasons why we don't do it. The only case we'll do it is if someone's going under general anesthesia and they've got, you know, uh, something that's concerning for another eye condition or something like that. Um, so we, yes, I, I would say overall, we actually do discourage it, but it's something that they're investigating and if that changes in the future we'll be happy to offer it. but right now there's not enough evidence on it okay if monofocal lens is used are the glasses needed over the counter or prescription lenses um, again another great question and this is where there, a lot of these questions are very individualized and you'll have to just talk with either me or the doctor that you see about some of these things but if you don't have astigmatism and we correct you for distance then maybe all you need is over the counter, okay? Um, if you have astigmatism and we aren't able to, we don't correct it, uh, then you'll still need glasses for distance and near. But again, it depends if you have astigmatism and how much and these different things. Um, but uh, um, yes, so, so I hope that helps answer that. Um, is surgery done at Reynolds location or do you go to a hospital? So all of our locations have cataract surgeons that can see you and evaluate you and do your pre and post-operative care. But all of our surgeries are done at our ambulatory surgery center, which is right next to our um, Huguenot office. Uh, it's about three miles from the Reynolds office. It takes about five, six minutes to get to. Um, it's uh, right next to the University of Richmond uh, on River Road by the Huguenot Bridge. Um, and again, when you come in for an evaluation, we get you signed up, we give you a folder, it has a map of where that is and all these different things. And we go through all the logistical information with you to make sure everything's clear. Um, so I hope that helps. Well, you guys had wonderful questions today. We really got to cover just about everything that, that I can think of. So um, I, I'm really uh, thankful that you all were able to join us tonight and, and answer questions. Um, I'll, I'll let Melissa finish up, but I'm happy to see you at, at any point, and uh, um, you can talk with our surgical coordinators or anyone else. And I'll let Melissa finish up. Thank you so much, Dr. Tucker, for um, volunteering your time and answering everybody's questions. Um, somebody did ask, you know, where surgery done? It is at our surgery center, as Dr. Tucker mentioned. Um, the best thing to do uh, as he was saying, is to schedule a cataract surgery consultation. Um, and you can do that by calling our main line at 287-2020 um, and just ask to speak with someone on our team to get you scheduled with Dr. Tucker or one of our other cataract surgeons. Um, we have eight locations 
in Richmond and um, we're happy to help you uh, just educate you on the best options and just a reminder, no need to take any notes because this will be recorded and we'll be sending out a link afterward to everybody who attended. Um, again, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening if there's no more questions. Dr. Tucker, do you have anything uh, you'd like to add? No, I thank everybody for coming and I hope, hope you learned a lot and we're happy to help you however we can. Awesome, all right, take care. <laughs>